flying snakes, species Chrysopelia paradisi, found in the Indo-Malaysian forests are unique snakes that can hurl themselves into the air from a branch, flatten their bodies into a sort of wing, and undulate to maintain balance. It's a visually striking form of locomotion, as seen in this high-speed video, with quite a bit of three-dimensional motion of the snake body. This overhead view shows that as the animal glides forward, it uses large amplitude side-to-side -side motion, continuously redistributing its body through the air. So, in effect, the snake is turning its whole body into a morphing wing. At each moment in time, we see consistent features of the wing body. These include long, straight segments, which are nominally perpendicular to the flow. These segments are connected by tight U-bends. As the snake undulates, it propagates these features down the body, and then forms a new straight segment near the head and continues until it lands. Many of us are familiar with animals that undulate in water and on land. However, flying snakes are the only animals that undulate through air. And because the fluid medium is different, we expect the physical considerations on locomotion to be different. Two key ways are force production and stability. First, the snake must produce out-of-plane lift and drag forces to offset its weight. Next, because the snake is in air, it has to contend with rotational stability in all three rotational degrees of freedom. We're going to focus on the question of what is the mechanical role of undulation on glide dynamics? To answer this, first we're going to discuss high resolution kinematics to define what aerial undulation is. What exactly is the snake body doing in the air? Next, we're gonna use these kinematics results to develop a mathematical model of snake flight, which enables us to answer the question, is undulation required for gliding? For these experiments, we used a large indoor arena at Virginia Tech. We would bring snakes to a height of about eight meters and have them jump and glide to the floor. We configured the glide arena with 23 camera high-speed motion capture system. For seven snakes, ranging in size, we recorded between 11 and 17 infrared markers placed along the dorsal surface. This is what comes out of the motion capture system. Here's a glide that's got 14 markers along the body, each shown as a different color. From the top and side view, you can see that these markers make an interweaving pattern. In this particular case, we recorded about eight meters of fall and four meters of horizontal distance. From these infrared marker locations, we can reconstruct the snake's morphing wing body. The first thing we do is fit a spline to the snake's body providing a continuous representation of the backbone of the snake. From the spline, we extract a tangent vector. This is a unit vector that is locally tangent to the body and points down from the head to the tip of the tail. This vector encodes the information about aerial undulation. Using the tangent vector, we overlay an airfoil coordinate system that defines the wing of the snake. We take the width of the animal as the cord of the airfoil, which gives us the cord line direction shown in red. And also, this defines the direction of the top of the animal, shown in blue. Next, we add shape and mass to the animal. To do this, we measure the width of the snakes from mid-glide silhouette images, and the mass distribution from snake sectioning. As you can see, both are nominally parabolic, peaking at the center of the animal, the 50% mark of the snout to vent length. We overlay the width and mass to reconstruct the snake. We have 36 trials to this level of detail. To characterize aerial undulation, we can use the tangent vector from before and how this changes along the body to define two waves of bending, a lateral wave seen in an overhead view and a vertical wave seen from behind. After an initial transient, we see that the flying snake uses these two coupled waves of bending, a large amplitude lateral wave in blue and a smaller amplitude vertical wave in green. Looking at just one time step, we can pull out some key features of aerial undulation. First is that the vertical wave has twice the spatial and temporal frequency as the lateral wave. That is, there are twice as many vertical bends as lateral bends. Second, zero crossings of the lateral wave correspond to the U-bends on the body. Next, these zero crossings are also peaks and maxima of the, later, of the vertical wave. This includes, this indicates that the two waves are phase shifted 
by 90 degrees, and that the maximum out-of-plane bending occurs at the U-bends. We quantified the wave coupling using a technique called complex orthogonal decomposition. We can see that the temporal and spatial frequency ratios are close to 2. And it's interesting to note that sidewinders use coupled waves of horizontal and vertical bending. However, the sidewinders waves have a frequency ratio of 1. So as far as we know, flying snakes are unique in how these waves are coupled. Now we're going to use our knowledge of aerial undulation to model the snake flight. Based on the experimental data, we propose these two analytical expressions for the lateral and vertical bending angles. We have a few set parameters, which we can vary, to change the aerial undulation. These two waves are coupled as before. And when I plot them, you can see that they look qualitatively similar to the experimental data. We can recover the body position by integrating the bending angles. And now the traveling waves of bending become aerial undulation. And we maintain all the kinematic features from the experiments. Now we need dynamic equations of motion. For the translational equations of motion, it is simple enough. We have F equals MA, where our forces are lift, drag, and gravity. The rotational equations of motion are more complicated, but on the left-hand side, we have the aerodynamic moments due to the distributed lift and drag forces. And on the right-hand side, we have rigid body motion and also inertial moments. These are moments that affect the rotational motion simply due to the snake moving mass around. To calculate lift and drag forces, we use previously measured lift and drag coefficients for a 2D cross-section of the snake's body based on an experiment. We treat each element of the snake's body independently, and to deal with the curved segments, we use simple sweep theory. Here's the output from the simulation. On the left, I'm just showing the rotational motion with the distributed lift and drag forces overlaid, and on the right, the center of mass position from a side and top view. You see that as the animal falls and picks up speed, it begins to produce forces, and that undulation redistributes how these forces act. You can see the snake rotates side to side, and then once it contacts the ground, we stop the simulation. A question we can ask with the mathematical model is, what if we turn undulation off? Here's a glide with the exact same initial conditions, except with no undulation. Very quickly, forces are produced, but because the snake's body shape is asymmetric, there is a force imbalance and the animal goes unstable, turning completely over and we stop the simulation. This instability is clear if we look at how the yaw, pitch, and roll angles vary during the glide. When undulation is turned off, we see a secular trend of the pitch and the roll angles away from zero degrees. With undulation, we see that the snake glides longer and glides further. These angles become periodic and oscillate around zero degrees. So we can conclude that undulation is enhancing the stability. What we presented today is the first full 3D kinematics analysis of flying snakes. We then use these kinematics to develop the first anatomically accurate model of snake flight. From our original question of what is the mechanical role of undulation on gliding, our analysis indicates that undulation enhances stability, enabling gliding. So flying snakes do in fact appear to use undulation differently than all other snakes.